1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8 will occupy us for perhaps two sessions. And I want to read it with you and then focus on verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So, Father, as we try to understand this passage and live it, open our minds to what it means to be living stones, what it means to come to a rejected stone, made a cornerstone, what it means to become a house, what it means to become a priesthood, what it means to offer sacrifices acceptable through Jesus. These are strange images for us, and we pray that they would not be ineffectual in producing the fruit that they're intended to by your Spirit. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What's remarkable is that uh, the contrast between verses 1 to 3 and verses 4 to 8 is so stark and abrupt. Here's an, here's an image. You are coming to a living stone. So Christ is pictured as a, a living stone, a stone that's alive, rejected by men but in God's sake. And then the whole section is the outworking of this image of Christ as a stone and you, like living stones, being built into a house, a priesthood, offering sacrifices. All of this is so different from these verses that came just before, like newborn infants long for milk, grow up by it, you've tasted the Lord is good. In other words, the image here is of um, birth and infant and uh, drinking and growing and uh, killing sin up here, putting to death malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander, all of that by virtue of having drunk deeply the milk, which is the kindness of the Lord in the word of the Lord. And suddenly, without any indication whatsoever, as you come to him, and, and we're expecting him to say, like newborn babes, to drink, it's all totally different, and he leaves behind the new birth image and the infant image and the drinking image, and he got a new image from somewhere. Why? What, what's the reason that this whole unit here is built around the living stone of Christ who is rejected by men but in the sight of God is chosen and precious. Now, Peter knows that Jesus referred to this passage that he's going to quote here. Maybe before I go to Jesus' words, I should just point out the three passages of, of the Old Testament that Peter is looking at. So here's one. Verse 6 is Isaiah 28, 16. 
And here's the next one. Verse 7 is Psalm 118, 22. And then here's the last one. A stone which the builders rejected, a, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And that's taken from Isaiah 8, 14. So Peter read his Old Testament on the lookout for stone, stone, stone in three different places. Now, why did he do that? Why, why did he link those Old Testament texts together and draw out lessons for us in these verses? And one of the reasons surely is that Jesus had told the parable, uh, the parable of the uh, tenants. And the master sent slaves to the tenants of the farm and said, give me my fruit, and they beat them. And then he sent the son, and they said, here's the heir, let's kill him, and, and the whole farm will be ours. And then Jesus said uh, this to interpret what happened. He said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, and then he quotes Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected, so the son who was just killed that God sent to him is the rejected stone. So Peter learned from Jesus that this stone in Psalm 118 is himself, Jesus, built, the builders rejected, has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. The Lord sent Jesus and intended him to be rejected and die for our sins and rise again. And this is marvelous in our eyes that Christ re was rejected. He died for sinners. He rose from the dead, became the cornerstone. And so Peter is all wired up to go to the Old Testament and find in Isaiah 28, 16, and Psalm 118, 22, and Isaiah 8, 14, these pictures of the Messiah, the suffering servant, as a stone. Now, the question is, why did he bring it up here in 1 Peter? What, what's prompting it? And here's all I know to do to help answer a question like that is to think about the book as a whole and things we know about what's going on here. And what we know, for example, is that in verse 1 of chapter 1, he's writing to people whom he sees as elect exiles. He's seeing us as a small, exiled people in the world Chapter 2, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. And so he's, he's seeing us as a people who are embattled and what becomes of these exiles for the time is past that suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality and passions and drunkenness and orgies and drinking parties and lawless idolatry. That characterizes this age. You don't belong to this age. You're an alien and an exile, and therefore you abstain from those things. And with respect to this, they are surprised that you don't join them anymore in the same flood of debauchery. And what's the effect? They malign you. So what's the picture of the people that he's writing to? They're aliens away from their homeland in heaven. They're exiles. They are called to live a lifestyle that puts them out of sync with the world. The result is that the world, which is very big and dangerous with a lot of power behind it, start maligning them and insulting them, and a fiery ordeal is ready to come upon them. And I think Peter stopped and he pondered, I'm asking these people to follow Jesus in the life he led, a life of rejection in order that they might 
also enjoy the life of glorification. And the imagery of the rejected stone comes to his mind in that regard. As you come to him, he's a living stone rejected by men, but in God's sight, chosen and precious. And I think Peter wants us to say, okay, that's us. We are rejected by men, just like it said in chapter 4, verse 5. And we are chosen and precious. So that's why I think the image came to his mind. So look what he does with it. You come to him. So you're coming to him now, which is the same as drink. So you come to him to drink and you come to him as a living stone. What happens when you come to him? And I think this means that today, tonight, this morning, you should come to him, draw near to him as a living stone. He was rejected and now he's alive as a living stone, but he is chosen and precious. And now, as you come to him, you yourselves like living stones. So you participate in the life of the stone that you come to. You as living stones are made alive. You as stones. When you come to a living stone, you are made a living stone. And you are built up as a spiritual house. So he's taking us as we come to him. And he's fitting us together to be a temple. And what's a temple for? The presence of the living God and his son, Jesus Christ. So he's fitting us together to be a corporate temple of the presence of God, and together we are going to be a priesthood. Now, notice how he mixes metaphors, but that's okay. This, he's just trying to draw out all that comes to his mind when he thinks about this imagery. First, we're a house where God dwells, and then we are functional in the house as a priesthood. And what do those priests do? They offer spiritual sacrifices. And what would those be? In Philippians, the sacrifice is the money that the Philippians sent to Paul. In Hebrews, the sacrifices are praises given to God. In Romans 1, the sacrifices are our our bodies. Here, I think, if we just drop back and say, what did he just tell them to do? He told them, don't be malicious, don't be deceitful, don't be hypocrites, envious, slanderers. What? Instead, instead of malice let there be love. Instead of deceit, let there be truth. Instead of hypocrisy, let there be what? Authenticity. Instead of uh, envy, let there be um, joy over the successes of others. Instead of slander, let there be encouragement and and, uh, praising. And what would those be? I think those are the fruits, those are the, are the sacrifices of the priesthood in the temple. This priesthood is not offering up lambs and bulls. This priesthood, which is made up of, of these living stones, which are sharing in the life of the rejected and the precious and risen Jesus, are a priesthood who offer spiritual sacrifices of obedience and, and praise to God. And if we think, well, mine aren't very good, <laughs> right? I mean, how are you doing with regard to love and truth and authenticity and joy in other people's successes, not just your own, and encouragement of others, not just wanting encouragement? How are you doing? And the answer is C minus, C plus, today, yesterday, B, I got a B on some good deed I did, none of which is adequate for a God who demands perfection, except that they are acceptable, read, (laughs) they're acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We have come to a living stone who died for us and who covers all the inadequacies of our acts of obedience so that the good in them, that is, the work of God by the Holy Spirit in them, is indeed acceptable. You can please God by offering spiritual sacrifices to him, by coming to him 
and being built with other Christians into a house as a priesthood to offer these sacrifices. So this is, even though this is strange imagery here for us, coming out of the Old Testament as it does, very practically it means as we come to him, we don't just drink of the milk. We are made living stones with his life, and we become a place where he dwells, and we become a a priesthood that offers things that really please him.